All right. Good morning. It's 1030, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We're so happy to have you here with us as we pivot MTSS Fest to this virtual event. First, I would like to thank our hosts and our sponsors, the University of Washington Smart Center, Kaiser Permanente, and the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction. My name is Joanna Brown. I am the School Climate Implementation Manager here at OSPI, and I will be your host for the session. Please share any questions that you have in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation, and we will try to get to as many of your questions as we can. We also have a few predetermined stopping points to ask uh, or answer your questions. Um, just a reminder that all participants are muted and none of you are on camera. Uh, it is my honor to welcome Dr. Jessica Swain Bradway to uh, Virtual MTSS Fest. Dr. Swain Bradway is the Executive Director of Northwest PBIS Network. Her previous roles include Research Director for the Midwest PBIS Network, Research Associate at the University of Oregon, and special education high school teacher. Dr. Swain Bradway is particularly adept at integrating and aligning initiatives within multi-tiered systems, including restorative practices and mental health support. She's an amazing support to the educators she trains and coaches, as well as a valued partner of, of OSPI. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Uh, Swain Bradway. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, I hope you can hear me well, and I trust you and Bonnie will make sure that I know if things are not running smoothly. You're a great team. I appreciate the introduction. Thank you all for joining us today. Let's get ourselves started. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, four big ideas, and embedded throughout, you will note that there are um, uh, downloadable resources and excellent um, kind of documents and examples and that's one of our goals for today. So we're going to list and define three high leverage classroom practices, describe how these practices can contribute to skill fluency across a whole range of skill sets, examples of how these practices can be applicable in your high school classroom, and identify the resources, like I said, so you can continue to track down the information and do as uh, Justin Poulos and Dr. George Sugai recommended, which is to take this back, uh, do something with your team. Alex, the PowerPoint is available and in the portal downloadable currently. So these are our three uh, high leverage classroom practices. These are the three things that we want you to, to write down and know. And for those of you that have a history of coming from elementary school or have taught in elementary school, these are going to be very recognizable. Unfortunately, what we find ourselves in a position as high school teachers, we don't learn a lot about the science of teaching or the science of behavior. <clears throat> we don't learn as much about the simple classroom management strategies that our elementary counterparts do. And that necessitates us to go out and find that information. The good news is that these are high leverage classroom practices that we think of as instructional for academic, instructional in nature and academically, but they are actually the high leverage practices that we can use to teach all of the things our high school kiddos and our high school colleagues need, including executive functioning skills. So while we have a lot of assumptions about this, the, the skills our colleagues and our kiddos have when they come to the workplace, uh, we know that the, having assumptions really sets us up for failure in some aspects of our work. Yeah. Yes, our high school kiddos, kiddos are bigger. Yes, some of them are given the responsibility of driving a car even, and they get to vote, and yet their executive functioning skills lag behind. So I want you to keep in mind that when we do our work in, in high school, we tend to have left some of these best teaching practices behind them, behind us when our kiddos were in that elementary, uh, elementary level. And they are extremely applicable and actually necessary for our kiddos now. So these are three high leverage practices that are amongst the agreements we make when we implement PBIS or multi-tiered systems of support. When we're adopting those frameworks, we're agreeing to use evidence-based practices, the most efficient and effective practices that we know of in our field. 
We make these agreements and the practices that we use find their way into our teacher behavior flowchart. So this is, these are again the agreements of the strategies we're going to use. They help us create a very consistent environment, not just for our kiddos, but for ourselves as colleagues. We do expect our educators to be heroes. And I think that is very obvious to the rest of the world right now. Um, and yet, uh, when we are running around in individually in our room and we're, you know, putting effort just into our classrooms, and I don't say just into our classrooms, when we're kind of operating in a singular manner, in a very siloed manner, and we are not working in congruence with one another, we are actually making life more difficult for each other. Right, we, we know that. And, and one very concrete example that stood out when I was a high school teacher was something as simple as the dress code. And I know some of you are groaning right now when I say that. Um, we had our dress code policies and some teachers enforced it and some did not. And um, <clears throat> I enforced it because it was the rule. And then the assistant, super, <laughs> the assistant vice principal came to me and said, uh, can you please stop sending kids down when they violate the the dress code. And I said, but Mr. Harris, it's, it's the rule. And he said, yes, but you're, you're inundating my office. It's making life very hard for me. And I thought, well, why do we have this rule then? So I agreed and I, I stopped sending kids down for dress code violations. <laughs> but that is a very simple, silly example of what all of you encounter on a day-to-day -day basis um, when you're in the building and perhaps even now online with distance learning. Um, it is even more power, more important for us to um, be working in consistency and in alignment with one another. Um, so these classroom teak practices that we agree to implement, uh, they are evidence-based, they are high leverage, meaning they give us the biggest bang for our buck and in our investment. And all of the things that we do that are kind of not exciting about PBIS and MTSS tier one implementation. So the policy realignment, our data collection and organization, uh, scoping out professional development, administrative observations, all of these things, they are the systems that allow us to implement these high leverage practices to be very, very good at them um, in our day-to-day -day work. In our day-to-day -day work because we are bombarded as teachers with <laughs> with all the things that children children bring to the school environment and we bring to the school environment as colleagues and humans right so we want to have very strong systems that support us to be consistent and focused in our work uh, Michael, there is a copy of this flow chart in the, at the Midwest classroom management site which I can put in the chat pod in just a moment here. So we're going to talk about the power of consistency very briefly and we're immediately going to move into our high leverage practices, defining them and examples of them. This is kind of our backdrop. Uh, Dr. Sagai did a great job this morning talking about building the new normal. So consistency, this is the opportunity for us to really focus on consistency in our work. And when we do that, we not only present a united front to support our kiddos and their families, we actually support one another when we are working consistently. So big, big picture idea. Uh, George said this morning, if you remember only two things, but I think he said that about eight times. So by my math, uh, you know, I do have a PhD. So <laughs> two times eight is 16. So 16 things this morning. But one thing I want you to take away is that redundancy builds fluency. This is an old school adage. We know practice makes perfect. Think about the skills we want our kiddos to do really, really well as social creatures. What are the social skills they need? And how much opportunity are we on purpose building for them to practice those skills? Practice those skills. Think about the way we build all of our um, academic curricula where we add as kids are small and they add, they get fluency in one skill we add the next one we add the next one we add the next one we're extremely purposeful in developing a scope and sequence or the order of and flow of content for academic curricula we want to have that same level of attunement 
for our social emotional well-being for our wellness skills if you will and not build them as an afterthought we often build them as an afterthought when people show us that they don't have them we also say things like well they should learn that at home and i'm going to say to you that's actually an erroneous line of thinking if we use the science of behavior to guide our work because the secret that's not a secret is behavior is contextual so i want you to think really hard right now about the way in which you're working and accessing information at home in this distance environment where we're all socially or physically isolated and then the way you work when you're actually in the school environment there are huge differences that are being prompted and reinforced or punished by the environment so home the home environment looks so different from the school environment that we cannot I cannot expect for kiddos and adults to have mastered how to school from spending weekends at home if you, if you follow that line of thinking i'm not sure that i'm being clear i've spent a lot of time this week uh, recording webinars which kind of gets to you this redundancy builds fluency so we want to practice within the school environment and we want to keep in mind or we want to practice on distance learning environment. Let's use that as our example right now. The harder a skill, the more difficult a skill and or the more, more obstacles there are to performing that skill, the more redundancy and focus of practice that we need. That's extremely important for us to remember. And we have this opportunity right now to actually be experiencing this as humans, as adults right that there's obstacles that are getting in the way of us performing our work of us learning new things and so we need to actually have more redundancy we know that consistent adult behavior in a school environment creates that consistent adult uh, student behavior in an environment and consistent student practice right we know that we know that there's trauma big t and trauma little t Trauma big T is a diagnosable trauma. Trauma little t is not necessarily something we would need therapeutic response to, uh, to heal from. But trauma is in the eye of the beholder. I don't get to tell Bonnie or Joanna if right now this period of time is, um, is traumatic for them, right? I don't, we don't get to do, I don't get to do that because it's how we interpret that. We have our own physiological and psychological response to a very stressful environment. And we know from Dr. Sugai's discussion this morning that the, the we can mitigate uh, for kiddos how they perceive the safety of the school by having a higher number of adults with whom they're interacting and having positive relationships with. So our school and expectations, our classroom rules, our high leverage classroom practices, these are all things that can help us mitigate the impact of trauma and stress because they help us focus on creating relationships by having dignified interactions with kiddos right dignified instructional interactions with kiddos and it creates a level of predictability okay so let's now talk about <clears throat> opportunities to respond I appreciate the questions in the chat pod about the format and the availability of the slides. And we will make sure that we um, address all of those for you as, as we are able to. So keep them coming. Thank you for helping us do our work better. Um, so thinking about, I'm gonna throw an audible here. So this morning, Dr. Sagai gave an example um, um, and just tried to assert he's not a tier three husband. <laughs> which I thought was hysterical. Dr. Sakai showed a, a, gr a great a kind of graphic organization within the triangle of where he is with his skill sets. I'm not gonna ask you to do that, but I want you to think for a minute about the, the factors in your life or the, the things that contribute to um, your skill set improving, you doing better. So if you think about something you have difficulty with that creeps up into that yellow zone or red zone level of need, and what are the factors that help you bring that down, right, to like greenish yellow or the green zone? And this is a this is a exercise for you to think about now because we can predict the things that will make life easier for us, and we can predict what will allow us to do better with our job right and our job as teachers is to predict what will make things 
more successful for our kiddos? What will enable them to access success, so to speak, okay? Our job as high school folks is not to just set this bar up here and say, come on, some of you will get it, some of you won't, you're just not trying hard enough. That's actually not our job. Our job is to use the science of teaching and to facilitate that success. It doesn't mean we carry kiddos on our back. It means that we build steps and we sh show the children how we walk up the steps and we cheer for them as they go up the steps. Once in a while, we might, might walk next to them as they go up the steps, okay? And the way we build that is by making sure our classrooms have high density of these best practices, okay? The first best practice that I want us to, I want you to put in your brain, I want you to make a poster, I want you to write it down on a sticky note and put it on the wall. This an opportunity to respond, or I, we call it OTRs at the University of Oregon, so an OTR. It's a teacher behavior that prompts or solicits a student response, okay? It can be asking a question, presenting dem a demand. This is the way we make our kiddos learning visible. We, we give them an opportunity to make their learning visible. And some, some of you are familiar with that, uh, that terminology. And someone's going to remind me in the chat pod of where, who else has said that. Um, but we're making learning visible. We want to have a range of, of opportunities to respond and different types of opportunities to respond. So we can increase the likelihood that all students, thank you, Sandra, John Hattie, we want to increase the likelihood that all students are engaged in the content in a variety of ways. Remember, redundancy builds fluency. We are building neuro pathways. We're building neuro pathways by repeating a skill or a behavior, okay? Academic behavior, social behavior. That's our job. So high school teachers, we cannot be living through Ferris Bueller's classroom where the teacher is asking questions and our kiddos have drool coming out of their mouths. Uh, we have to kind of the, if you will, go kindergarten a little bit, where we have activities um, set up in various iterations for kiddos to engage, make their learning visible, do some self-monitor and get some feedback. So how do we do that? Well, let's jump right to how we do that. Oh, hold on, before we do that, to think about with this, something that I want you to think about as we're, as we're creating this is right now, how long do your kiddos go before they're asked to make their learning visible, okay? Now remember, we're in this age of distance learning, and so how long kiddos go before they make their learning visible right now is different than how long they go when we're actually in the building together. So our job is to be putting this information into two different parts parts of our brain right now. One, how do we do this in distance learning? It, we're going to be hindered in many ways, right? Two, when our kiddos come back and we're all in the same buildings together, how will I modify the way that I have been teaching so that kids are not going a long time before they're asked to make their learning visible, okay? Um, are we able to see everyone's learning most of the time? Who's visible and who is invisible? And uh, Superintendent Reichdahl spoke about this this morning, the lack of access for a lot of our kiddos. Um, in California uh, alone, we have, you know, millions of kiddos that do not have access to distance learning, um, to internet. So in our distance learning, as well as in the classroom, are we able to see everyone's learning? Who's visible and who's invisible? Who are we calling on the most, right? If you can think of the kiddos who typically get the wrong responses, that's actually you thinking of the kiddos who need higher rates of opportunities to respond. So, because here's the trick, the kiddos that need the highest uh, number of opportunities to respond are the kiddos who are giving us the wrong answers, right? So when you're problem solving for a kiddo and you're saying this kiddo isn't achieving, this kiddo isn't achieving, the automatic direction I want you to go is how do I increase the opportunities for this kiddo to practice correctly. How do I increase the opportunity for this kiddo to practice correctly? The response is, well, I put the bar and that kiddo just needs to do it. That is not the promise that we make uh, within our PBIS or MTSS systems. Remember, the promise is that we agree uh, it's part of the system to use best practices, the highest leverage practices. Um, 
and you are allowed to use other practices and you will not find the same results. That's why these are called high leverage practices, okay? We're going to be missing out on something or someone. So here are some general types of strategies and I will provide different examples as we go through. Um, if you have questions about the strategies, I appreciate folks are using the chat pod, put a question in there for us. If you have a suggestion for how you've done this, put it in the chat pod for us. While we cannot all be together and see each other right now, we can certainly exchange our great ideas. And very honestly, you all have brilliant creative ideas that I could not possibly have because I have a my range of my range of experience is this. I mean, we have this range of experience right now. That's this. We have 140 some people on on this webinar right now, which is pretty amazing. So there are different types of strategies, and some of these you're going to hear and you say, "Yes, I already do that." Remember, our goal is to say, "How during distance learning do I increase opportunities to respond for all kiddos?" And when I transition, we transition back, how am I going to modify to increase opportunities to respond for a handful of kiddos or for, no, for all kiddos. <laughs> They're all kiddos. Thanks for correcting me on that one. So we have individual or small group questions. And we do this a lot. This, some of it's the hand raising. I'm going to ask you to get away from the hand raising because who raises their hand? The same kid who knows it all the time, right? So we're going to get away from hand raising and we're going to use response patterns that allow us to make sure we're getting all of the kiddos in the classroom. So if we have a seating chart and we have four quadrants and we put a dot for each time we, we call in that quadrant. If we have um, popsicle sticks, kiddos names on popsicle sticks. Uh, I know it sounds elementary school, but listen to how cool the system this is. I have all kiddos names, every kiddo has a popsicle stick. And what I do is I might add a handful more popsicle sticks for Jessica, for example, if I'm talking about a math concept that I know Jessica needs more of. Or I actually might just put Jessica's popsicle bat stick back in the can so that I have the higher likelihood of calling her again. So we have some random calling, but we also have ways to boost that those numbers, okay? So we have our individual or small group questioning. We have chor choral responses, which might sound kind of, again, elementary school. But think about this, for, for high school kiddos and, and um, middle school kiddos, the ability to save face is extremely important. So if we have a choral response where we write something on the, on the board and we turn around and we say, I'm gonna give everybody, uh, ask, give everybody um, five seconds to think about this response and we're all gonna say it out loud, right? So we say, what's the capital of Oregon? What's the capital of Washington? What state borders uh, or what country borders um, Washington to the north? And we give kiddos time and they all get to say it. We get to look at their faces and see if their mouths are moving. And they may or may not have known it. They may have just gone, which is okay. But now the kiddos are hearing other kids respond, right? They're hearing other kiddos respond. We can also have incorporate movement into this. We can have nonverbal responses as well. So some of you are saying, yeah, we do that. Thumbs up, thumbs down. I hope kids hold up their finger. Is it the response number one, two, or three? We've got it. So your goal is to intermingle these and switch them up as much as possible. For individual responses, yes, it is writing is an individual response. Kids can be writing. But think about how long they go before then they're getting feedback on that response. And that's part of our um, the second strategy we're going to talk about, which is error correction, right? So this is, this is, I call it the magic teaching sandwich. Kids, we provide an opportunity to respond and kids make their learning visible. We give them error correction, right? And if we had to correct an error, we give them another opportunity to show us. If they get it correct, we give them praise. Yes, I love how you answered that, great job, okay? So we have, we, we have different types of strategies and our goal is not just to say, yes, I know them, to think about how to intermingle all different formats of response so that every kiddo has the opportunity to engage in the content, right? 
For our nonverbal response strategies, we do things like whiteboards. We could have response cards. We have A, B, C, and D written on this is something you could do in distance learning, right? Kids take a piece of paper, they write A, B, C, and D on it, and you ask a question in your Google Hangout room or your Zoom meeting, and you say, kiddos, if you think the answer is A, show me an A, B, C, right? We can do that, right? So we can, we can pre-print some of these things. It changes up the way our kiddos are interacting in with the content. Uh, we can't do this right now. Come on back here. We can't do it right now in terms of um, necessarily kids moving around our classroom right now, but certainly we could say in a, in a Zoom platform or in a Google Hangout when we're in the face-to-face -face online format, hey, everybody stand up if you agree, sit down right, move as far away from the camera, come back, we can do those things. I know our PE teachers are doing a tremendous job sending home activities and, and information for kiddos. And still, my eighth grader really doesn't want to get up from her desk. So if we make her, <laughs> if we make her get up from her desk and move around for a lesson, not only is she moving, she is actually can actually be demonstrating uh, some of her knowledge every time that my kiddos or our kiddos are interacting they with that content they are building those narrow pathways one more um uh, kind of uh, strategy or approach is guided notes. Uh, if you use guided notes in your class already please give me a, a yes or a sure thing in that chat pod make sure our brains are moving there um, guided notes are really helpful and they actually good we got some yeses wanda gets a star for responding right away love it um, guided notes are something we actually can all use as grown-ups uh, as as kiddos um, i started using them when i was teaching a graduate course in behavior advanced behavior management i had a lot of students that spoke english as a second language and i was giving them and everyone entry tasks yes we love using them for adult pd thank you sandra um, i was giving uh, entry tasks and my uh, students who spoke English as a second language weren't getting them done in the five to seven minutes in, in what as I was checking in with my graduate students when they came into class. So I created guided notes. These are very helpful for us, um, not just for teaching note taking. So some of you are going to notice that the strategies I'm talking about do align very closely and overlap with AVID strategies. Um, you can think of uh, using AVID strategies as a gateway to kind of pull these strategies into all of your classrooms and not just at your AVID rooms. Um, guided notes allow even small kiddos or even kiddos that might have limited English or language proficiency to write in key concepts, relationships, facts, et cetera, to draw the pictures. And they're engaging in a multiple, multiple ways here. They're reading, they're writing, they're making connections, okay? For opportunities to respond and distance learning, let me see if I did this correctly. I would like for you to put in the chat pod right now, do a little thinking, what types of opportunities to respond are currently available to your students? So what are they doing to show you they're learning? And they're learning right now. It's okay if it's, <laughs> if it's just a hello, how are you? For our class meetings, that's fine, but do a little chatting in the chat pod for us. Let us know what types of opportunities to response your kiddos are engaging in. So we've got Flipgrid responses. Great. Google Classroom. Mm -hmm. Good. I love these. Good. We've got discussion posts. We've got phone calls. Amazing. That's a very good opportunity to respond right now. Surveys, paragraphs, yes, no. Short answers, yes. Fabulous. Great. So if you are, um, type it in the chat pod, do take time to scroll through the chat pod and steal some other ideas from some of your colleagues here. Okay, so we are, let me see what else. I'm gonna skip ahead to number <clears throat> three because now I want you to think systematically. So you have a range of opportunities to respond. If we look at number three right now, have you made a list or has your school made a list uh, or your district of all the different types of activities you can be engaging in as teachers. Okay, so what are, what are the things that are accessible? What are the good ideas going on in your district? 
And this is, so this is where those PBS systems and MTSS systems really come in handy. Your district tier one team and or your school tier one team can be generating lists uh, that are accessible to all of you that show you how to do some of these various, not just the platforms themselves, but the types of activities. So what types of activities are you doing through Google Form? Right, or what types of activities are you engaging in when kids are doing Flipgrid? Flipgrid, okay. Um, so we've got some good recommendations going on here. So this is part of the PBS systems. Not taking too much longer to talk about these. Do you have PLC grade level meetings to share and refine these great ideas? So when you're having your grade level meetings or your content meetings, are you sharing these ideas and coming up with agreement? on how you're going to be teaching and presenting and practicing these. Okay, good. I see we've got some weekly PLCs with one another and other admin, good. So we have our great ideas. We're gonna boost o OTRs as much as we can and we're gonna refine this over time and distance learning. And then we're gonna make sure that this process of talking about opportunities to respond and holding ourselves accountable is actually part of our day-to-day -day work or week-to-week -week work as a system, as an entire school. So we put something like opportunities to respond on the agenda for our meetings, our weekly meetings, oh my gosh. Now we've gone away from teachers generating all these amazing ideas by themselves and then calling their BFF teacher friend to talk about it. We've gone away from that, which we do a lot to our high school teachers in particular. We keep them very isolated. And we've moved the idea and the focus and the brilliant idea generation to something very systematic. It's actually on our meeting agendas. Okay, so now you're thinking, wow, Jessica, I didn't actually, wasn't actually thinking about PBIS in that way or MTSS in that way. Yes. We're going to solidify, we're going to align, we're going to work together. That's the power of our systems, okay? Let's talk about error correction. Am I slipping or skipping around the slides? You know it, because that's what I do. We're doing super on time. So error correction, remember I said the kiddos are making their learning visible. They're making their learning visible, great. Now what do we do when they make it, when they do something incorrectly? And for those of you on PBIS teams or, or yearning to be on a team, I want you to note that in the PowerPoint when you download it or the PDF, um, and we will get you one without that green bubble on slide five, uh, that within each section there is a mention of the tiered fidelity inventory. Now for, for my systems geeks, you know the tiered fidelity inventory. This helps us assess the systems aspects that I was referring to earlier on. So can you give me a yes, no, or maybe in the chat pod if you know your school is using the tiered fidelity inventory to assess your PBIS strategies? Woohoo, we got some yeses and nopes. Good job being honest. Not yet, I love it. I love the yet in there, Sandra, that's great. Okay, so error corrections. Kiddos are going to do something wrong. In our classroom, we create a continuum of response strategies. You will notice that none of these response strategies include using sarcasm or yelling no. <laughs> So what we're going to do is we're going to focus specifically on error correction, the simple dignified reteaching. The big idea is that when we have our kiddos in front of us, and even when we're in distance learning, we want a range of ways for kiddo to redirect kiddos and grownups. Think about this as we can use these strategies as well for our grownups. If you're really excited about the continuum of response strategies, never fear, because the next two slides provide concrete definitions of this little snake like thing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to jump to defining error correction as an informative statement and then I might tiptoe back a little bit to talk about the rationale. Okay, let's define it and then we'll go to the rationale because I just like that order right now. It's nice to see Trisha Haggerty on the call today. So error correction is an informative statement. It's an informative, not sarcastic provided by a teacher or other adult following the occurrence of an undesired behavior. Okay, it is contingent. So it occurs immediately after the undesired behavior. It is specific. It tells the learner exactly what they're doing incorrectly and what they should be doing in the future that's different. And it's brief. We redirect and we move on. We redirect and we move on. And when the, if we call it a redirection, that may help us with the language in our head, right? So it is instructional, 
correction. And while it is very easy for us to correct things like the capital of Pakistan, right? Who knows the capital of Pakistan right now without Googling it? I promise you, you learned it in school, okay? But if you, it's, we can correct, we're gonna correct this academic content. We do it very, it's Islamabad, but good job, Aaron. I appreciate you, you tried. Yes, good. Okay, so uh, we correct the capital of Pakistan, we say, uh, Aaron, stop. Actually, the capital, or we don't have to say stop. We say, that was very elementary school, wasn't it? You can tell I have smaller kiddos. <laughs> we say, Aaron, the capital of Pakistan is actually Islamabad. And then we say, can you go ahead and correct that, write that down in your paper? Thank you. Right? Super easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Great. We get into an issue, especially with our bigger kiddos, because we get offended, where we are failing to correct their social errors or their social mess ups the same way we correct academics. So for all the skills we want our kiddos to learn, we have opportunities to respond correctly, as many as we need to, to give them extra practice so they can get good at it. And when we're doing error correction for every error that we make as human beings, we get to use this informative statement. And remember what I said about um, these practices help establish and maintain relationships because we are more likely to engage in dignified interactions when we rely on and fall back on error correction that is instructional, right? That is instructional. Getting a funny comment from Patrick in the chat pod, just making me chuckle if y'all want to read it. Okay, so why do we have brief, scripted, and instructional responses? And I think this fits in very well with Patrick's response in the chat pod. So systematic correction, instructional correction, has a positive effect on behavior. Okay, we have lots of resources that, that prove that to us outside of our own home. <laughs> Consistent corrections are actually performed more superior to those delivered inconsistently. That makes sense. We want correction immediately when we do something incorrectly. So we don't remember and practice the incorrect. Remember what I said about how long do kids go before they get feedback? How long do they go when they make their learning visible? The longer they go, the more likely they are to be internalizing and creating errors. I know this is a challenge for distance learning. We're going to do the best we can and get better at it over time. And part of how we do that is by getting really, really familiar with these strategies, okay? Um, in exclusion and punishment are ineffective at producing long-term reduction in problem behavior. I know that that's a, an old citation, however, it still holds true. When we exclude and punish, so we shame or we isolate, we have now eliminated the possibility of kiddos practicing correctly or getting feedback. And think about this, um, would you send a kiddo out of the room for being unable to convert an improper fraction? I would not say to Patrick, Patrick, I am really tired at the way you're treating this improper fraction, and I'm not sure how your parents raised you, but I'm going to tell you to go and see, <laughs> go into the hallway, and when you've figured out how to do improper fractions and convert them, you may come back into the classroom. <laughs> now I'm laughing because that is ridiculous, and I actually want someone to create a YouTube video for me that demonstrates how silly that is. We don't do that for academics. We're going to stop doing that for social, skill development and social errors. So some of you are saying, well, but the kiddos right now on distance learning are being disrespectful, so we're just turning them off. And I'm like, I'm thinking, oh man, that um, now what? Now how are they gonna learn? Now what are, the, what are the limitations for them now, okay? So simply excluding a kiddo uh, or an adult even from an interaction does not allow the opportunity for them to continue to learn and it does not help the relationship. It's not doing anything to advance your relationship. And remember, relationships are a huge protective factor for all of us. Relationships keep it keeps our stress levels from being from going from tolerable to toxic. It can mean the difference between trauma and stress, right? When we move up into that trauma big T. So we are looking to protect the relationship. And one of the ways we can do that is through these high leverage practices. Now think about this. If we predicted the ways kids might make social errors and we really taught how to avoid those errors, the same way we teach how to avoid the errors with really complicated math issues or, the, or some of the errors we might make in, in learning about history or science, right? 
my science teachers out there, you take time and you point out uh, the confusing components in, in a formula for balancing, you know, our neurons and electrons, not neurons. I just mixed up two different fields of science. Please don't tell anyone I did that. But <laughs> neutrons and electrons and protons, we, we point out the errors that kids might make as a matter of fact in our academic instruction. So our job is to do that with our social instruction with our social skills you're probably doing it right now in with distance learning you're pointing out the ways that kiddos and and their parents might be making mistakes right so you can avoid that from going on now remember what i said about systems when that becomes that predicting and preventing is an agenda item on our meetings we are using amazing collective brain power to teach with precision and to reduce the number of times we might have to use error correction, right? And when we rely on that error correction, we are going to be immediate, brief, and contingent. So contingent means right away we're gonna correct it. So writing an office referral and then sending a kid to the office with a referral and they, they're waiting for 45 minutes to talk with an administrator because they're very busy, it turns out. That's not immediate. Hmm, it's not. There is always a time and place okay there's usually not always for many of us having a time to decompress and regulate before we interact about a big event can be very helpful and we are allowed to do that and when we come back so trish i'm going to pick on trisha for a second because i know her and she's an amazing human so trisha has this uh calls calls me a name and i'm the teacher and she throws something across the room and i ask her i say trisha that's unsafe uh, please step into the hallway for a minute. I'll come talk to you. Okay. I'm allowed to take some, I call, and of course I call my um, administrator, Joanna, say, hey, Joanna, Trisha had a moment. She's in the hallway. Can you just swing down make sure she's fine? Yes. Okay. Now I come down, Trisha comes down. She comes back in the room later on and we talk and the principal may be there, but I'm now I'm going to go into that corrective statement and say, Trisha, when you called me <laughs> a bad name, <laughs> I'm laughing because I've been called amazing names as a high school teacher. When you called me that name, uh, it made me feel unsafe and it made me feel sad. So in the future, when you were angry, um, this is what I'd like you to do. Now let's you know, now let's talk about what led up to this, right? So we don't we don't allow everyone to just run around and be crazy ah, and all that stuff. We use our our scientifically proven strategies in the time and space as accurately as we can as that situation allows us to, okay? Now, this is what I want you to think about. This is something for you to take back um, to your team. And uh, you can actually also put it in the chat pod if, you, if you're prepared to do that. But some of you are, are having already put in a position where kiddos are being uh, really out of control on Zoom meetings, in Google chats, et cetera, et cetera. So what I want you to do is I want you to make a list of the behaviors that prompt you or would prompt you to have the reaction that kid doesn't get to be on the Zoom meeting, that kid doesn't get to be on a call, okay? And then for each one of those behaviors, either real or you know hypothesized so that you are prepared, um, you, <laughs> thank you, Trish. <laughs> Then for, that, then for that list of either hypothesized or real uh, behaviors, your team needs to identify how you've taught, practiced, and reinforced the behavior you want to see. Because you know I'm talking about reinforcement next is our magic teaching sandwich. Opportunity to practice correctly. We dose this up as much as we need to so kiddos can attain the skills we want them to attain. They can be fluent in it. When we need an error correction, it is a dignified reteaching. That's where we're going to focus on a dignified reteaching, right? That's a very high leverage practice. And then the last thing we do is we use our behavior specific praise. I'm going to get into that in just one second because I want to make sure I've thoroughly explained this activity. Okay. So this is an activity for you to engage in right now as a team to problem solve on distance learning. How do we translate this to back in the building when we're in brick and mortar? We're going to create the same list. And we're going to identify how we practice, taught, and reinforced, okay? You want to take it a little further, do a little differentiated instruction right now. For those of you that are already teaching and practicing and reinforcing, or you feel as though you're doing that, you're going to make a list of the times 
in which you are more likely and least likely to reteach as a form of error correction? Is there a specific behavior that pushes your buttons and you're least likely to reteach? Are there behaviors or students for whom you are always willing to reteach? Now we're starting to address equitable use of teacher practices, right? And we're going to go right to error correction. Why? Why do I want you to focus on error correction when you think about when you're least and most likely? Because an office referral is decided to be, a teacher decides when they're going to write an office referral. Okay, we get guidance within our PBIS systems of what is an office supported and what is a classroom managed, correct? Notice I said office supported behavior and classroom managed, we get that. And we decide when to write that referral. So let's look very clearly at the behaviors, the activities, the time of day, the students for whom we are most likely to use a dignified error correction and we're least likely to use dignified error correction. That is not, we're, we're not gonna walk away and hang our heads and we're all racist or we're all sexist or we're all ableist. We're not, that's not the intention. The intention is to draw our, is to draw our focus to what we call vulnerable decision points in discipline in which we're more likely to make a decision based on bias and least likely to make a decision based on the strategy that is evidence-based for that moment in time. Okay, so if we're not willing to look at that, then we're not actually going to be changed that, to be able to change that. Okay, so here are some bunch of different activities embedded in there. You can take back to your team and be like, hey guys, I saw Jessica this week and she was great. And uh, even Trisha agreed the hallway chat for redirection was super. Um, and these are some activities we can engage in right now. They help us address distance learning needs and they will help us address in the future when we're back in the building. So our last strategy, and I am killing it for time in a good way, uh, is behavior specific and contingent praise. I love praising people. I do it all the time. Um, I, I do it accidentally sometimes. Behavior specific praise is one of the most, uh, most robust strategies, I mean like the strongest durable strategies we can use to change behavior. And you can focus on this right now. I was glad to see Patrick was saying that they had um, high leverage classroom practices and they were saying, hey, go back to your house and use these at home. Using behavior specific praise, getting really good at it right now and using it during distance learning, sending it out in emails to colleagues and parents on phone calls, it will absolutely change your life. I promise you, it's a core feature, it's a core strategy within our uh, school-wide PBIS system. And the reason for that is because it is such a high leverage practice, okay? So with my, uh, my again, my measurement and um, fidelity gurus out there know the tiered fidelity inventory. Um, if you're not familiar with it, you're gonna notice that a lot of what I talk about is right in there. It's like, it's a manual written for you to implement positive <laughs> behavior specific praise. Thank you, Chris said he loved my specific examples. That was a really good example of behavior specific praise. So thanks for setting us up, Chris. A behavior specific praise statement is ver verbal or written feedback that is descriptive, specific, and de delivered contingent upon demonstration of the expected behaviors. And it's a ratio of five to one. You may have heard the ratio of four to one. I actually think that was an error and I will blame Dr. George Sugai for that. But it's a ratio of five to one. And that ratio is actually creates a protective factor for our kiddos, as well as the people with whom we're actually in, in, engaging and delivering that praise to. So it turns out there's a, um, a Gottman Institute uh, for Relationships, which is in the Seattle region, some of you may know of it. And uh, Dr. Gottman and his colleagues have been doing research for years on the factors that can predict the longevity and health of relationship. And this is one of those factors. What is the ratio of, of praise statements of positivity, if you can think of it that way, to that redirection or that correction? Now you'll notice I didn't say it's a five to one with the one being a shaming. <laughs> That's not, that's not what it is. It's a correction or a redirection. And we interpret the health and the, the kind of reinforcingness, I think I just made that up, of a relationship based on that ratio, okay? So that it turns out that ratio is actually very applicable also in the school environment, okay? 
So to be able to be, as, um, we want this behavior specific praise statement to uh, be, be genuine, be specific, and be frequent. Okay, now it turns out it's not just a protective factor for kiddos, it's actually a protective factor for us uh, delivering it. Now, now bear with me, I don't have the science yet all worked out in my brain. Um, I, I am a doctor, but I also play one on TV. So when we deliver behavior specific praise, when our job is walking around and catching what's going well, we are actually um, having a physiological a positive response to that thought and that behavior right we're focusing on the good when we're focusing on the negative and we're getting stressed no don't uh, and we're doing that every time we do that and we have that negative reaction we actually have a physiological response to that stressor as well right we have cortisol we have adrenaline when we're focused on the good we're spending more time generating uh, kind of those happiness hormones if you will versus spiking our cortisol Okay, so it's not just a protective factor for our kiddos. It is a protective factor for us delivering the praise. It also turns out to be very good for relationships. And by the way, today's my 17th wedding anniversary, speaking of relationships, and behavior-specific praise has helped us with those 17 years. So here's something that we, I get pushed back a lot about in high school. I don't wanna give them coupons. I don't wanna give them tokens, and thank you for the congratulations. Tokens or coupons simply prompt the adult to use behavior specific praise. It is about the praise. It is not about the token. If I give you a, uh, this is my, my community coupon and I hand it to a kiddo, I say, Bonnie, thank you so much for being an amazing uh, IT tech person facilitator today for our, for our presentation. I really appreciate that, right? I'm gonna look at Bonnie, I'm gonna say her name, I'm gonna be close enough, which we can't do right now, to deliver the coupon or the token. It's not about the coupon or the token, it's that those things remind us and invite us to make a connection with the kiddo, okay? So how do we, so let's jump to, I'm gonna do one thing before I, I do this other thing. I know I'm, I'm talking about my thinking right now. So how are we doing this with distance learning right now? I'm going to call another audible. I would like for you in the chat pod, if you have a reinforcement system or a reinforcement strategy that they're using in your school right now in, for distance learning, give us a little heads up. Give us some information about that and tell us about it in the chat pod. And I'm going to stop talking for a second while you chat and take a drink of water. <clears throat> So think about the behaviors that you want kiddos to have during distance learning. <clears throat> and uh, Chris, that's a great question. The reinforcement can be about any of the behaviors you want your kids to be using right now. In a school, we tend to focus those, our, our tokens or our coupons or our attention at the beginning of year on something a little different, attendance, on time, et cetera, et cetera, right? We get further into the school year and we may do coupons or tokens or attention on having an organized folder, right? On uh, persevering, on asking a specific question instead of going, mm. So I remember our reinforcement systems shift over time. We're always tempting our kiddos and our grownups into that next level of development, okay? If you, yes, that's a great one. I like how you use specific text to support your argument. That's a great one. So behavior specific praise for high school doesn't need to be walking feet and kind hands. Behavior specific praise for our high school kids is asking them, inviting them, and, and rewarding them for using executive functioning skills, for using higher level thinking skills, for using their words when they're angry, for reaching out to a grown up when they feel stressed or sad. Okay, so we have strategies. Some of you are using strategies, and thank you, Matt. Nice to see you, Matt, for being um, being honest about it. It's not systematic yet. So I want you to go from singular practices. <clears throat> we have we have control in our practice right now when I'm talking with my kiddos to thinking systematically about this being applicable across all of your teachers for all of your kids. Now, in a time of distance learning, we want all of our teachers to be doing it the same way. Why? Matt may need to, to do something with his kiddos and I step in and I'm running his Google Classroom uh, because we have that flexibility right now and we're working hard to support each other. I need to be able to provide the praise 
and use that strategy for reinforcement the same way Matt does. There is a difference between positive contact and behavior specific praise. So don't get caught here. Positive contact, I have a colleague who used to call this the granny effect. Okay, this is positive contact, happy to see you, have something to eat, you know, how's your football team doing this year, nice to blah, blah, blah. So this helps to create a positive environment and foster positive relationships, but it is not behavior specific praise. Behavior specific praise is like breadcrumbs into that next level. It is contingent upon behavior. It increases the likelihood it'll be, it'll be repeated. It is one tool that we use to get to intrinsic motivation. We make it up. We are making a false reinforcement system. I understand it doesn't exist all of it in the real world, right? We move to reinforcement of job security, paycheck, insurance, possibly chocolate. <laughs> But we, we do use the reinforcement system for grown-ups as we get older, we go longer. The reason we're using praise and we're using opportunities to respond, dignified error correction to reteach and praise is because while we have children trapped in a Google Classroom or in a physical building, we are having them practice those neuro neurological pathways. We want them to set those neurological pathways so strong that in the face of other obstacles that they will surely encounter just by nature of being human, they will be able to perform those skills the way we want them to without even thinking about it. That's our job, that is teaching. That's why we use behavior specific praise and that's why you use coupons and tokens. So the idea that we kids should just be doing those things, you're going to get to throw that away and say, eh, we're going to show ourselves to death, right? They should, and we can be angry about that, or we can create the conditions that increase the likelihood that they are going to use that, and they're accessing reinforcement and thereby our support, right? Oh my goodness, this stuff is so exciting. It's freaking me out. So we deliver behavior-specific praise. Now you're asked, now you're saying, well, Jessica, how do I remember all of this now that you're, you're going to get off the call and you're going to go do other things and I'm going to go about my day? Oh, never fear. I said that there would be resources. So I'm going to write, type it in the chat pod and you can look it up while you are, hold on. I'm doing that thing. When I was a high school teacher, I couldn't write on the board and talk at the same time. And my kids would ask me questions and then I'd write the word I was saying and they just thought that was the funniest thing in the world. Um, so you're gonna go to midwestpbis.org. This is my old team. They have on their classroom tab, they have a PowerPoint for each one of these strategies I've just spoken about. And they have this thing called a classroom management snapshot. The classroom management tools, these snapshots, there's one for opportunities to respond, error correction, and praise. It is one to two pages. Sometimes they're two pages because there's a little self-assessment at the bottom of it. This summarizes the information that I've shared. So you can get on a call and share this information with your team. You can have them read it. You can use it in staff meetings once we're back in brick and mortar. <clears throat> you use it as staff meeting to say, everyone, we're really gonna pay attention to opportunities to respond. This is what it looks like, sounds like. For the next, next week, your job is to think about how many opportunities to respond are you given in a, giving in a moment or in a 20 minute session. You can record yourself and then bring it back, bring it to your, your staff meeting, and we're going to talk about it, okay? So we, we can use these tools. So you're going to find that classroom tab for Midwest. You're going to note that there's a classroom management snapshot for opportunities to respond, for error correction, which apparently I forgot to put in the PowerPoint, and for behavior-specific praise. And like I said, we have these little observations, either a self-assessment, you can do it this way. You can, you can also sit in on a colleague's Zoom meeting and tally the opportunities they give kids to respond. And remember, Chris had asked, is it a behavior? Is it a social behavior or academic behavior? You get to choose. What do you want them to practice the most? That's where you can focus your attention. Do they need to practice staying quiet and having their eyes on the screen? Then you give them lots of practice and reinforcement and you count those opportunities to respond. So these fidelity tools are these checklists that we have in here and you'll notice there's a lot of references to the articles, which I know everyone's looking up diligently. There are hyperlinks in here for best classroom practices. This is one of my favorite uh, documents and not just because I helped write it, but if you hyperlink, there will be examples of all these different strategies, um, the defined examples and non-examples, and then further resources for you to continue your learning, okay? 
So your job now is to think about these things in terms of distance learning. How can you apply them? Send questions, for real, I actually mean it. You can email me and here's an even easier email I'll put in the chat pod because I have a very cool IT guy who said, your email is long, let's make it shorter. So you can email me either at jessica.swainbradway or jessica at PBIS network. Um, connect with us, ask questions. You need more information, hop on our website. We have a bunch of free webinars coming up in collaboration with both, both OSPI as well as the University of Washington Smart Center. For any follow-up questions, we're at one minute out. It's brilliant timing. For any, for all follow-up questions with center and session and presenters, send your, your email to um, uh, right here, CISL. We're gonna have a recording of the sessions. Um, your feedback and your, con and your contact is very invaluable. And I really mean it when I say that um, I didn't think I could have more admirations for teachers than I already do, and, and I do now. Um, this really an amazing time to see how brilliant and dedicated are, all of you are, and you are already heroes uh, in my mind. So thank you very much. That is the end of our time. We are at 1130. I'm going to stop talking and see if Joanna has anything to share with us to close us out. I am, um, I think you reminded everybody the same things I was going to remind, just uh, where to send questions um, in general, um, either directly to Jessica or to Thistle at k12.wa.us. On behalf of OSPI, thank you for joining us. Um, and if we will make sure that all questions um, are answered. So thank you.